Welcome everyone uh, to the Migration Policy Center seminar series. Um, we're pleased to have you today. We're joined with uh, Dr. Peo Hansen, who will talk about how modern monetary theory could be a catalyst for modern migration theory. Um, thank you to all of those who are in the room and joining online. Uh, my name is Stephanie Acker. I am a uh, research associate at the Migration Policy Center and pleased to be your chair for today. Um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hansen shortly, um, who's going to present for 20 to 25 minutes. Um, and then after that, we'll have um, a lot of time for Q&A. So be prepared with your questions. Um, if you are joining us online and would like to ask a question, you can write the question in the chat when we, um, when we open that up. Um, if you are following along here and also tweeting or doing other uh, or using other forms of social media, please feel free to tag us if you're going to post about the event. Um, so let me welcome Dr. Peo Hansen. He is a professor of political science at the Institute for Research on Migration, Ethn Ethnicity and Society, also known as Remesco at Linköping University. Uh, he's also currently the Simon Vale Fellow um, at the Robert Schumann Center here at the European University Institute. His books include A Modern Migration Theory, An Alternative Economic Approach to Failed EU Policy, and Euro-Africa, The Untold Story of European Integration and Colonialism. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hansen. Thanks a lot. I, I hope the mic works uh, all right. So th thanks a lot for this opportunity to the center and to everybody who is here and, and online. Uh, it's a great opportunity for me to, 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 uh, to just present my current work and, and, and take uh, comments and questions on that. So how modern monetary theory could be a catalyst for modern migration theory is more be a catalyst for modern migration policy. But of course, we need to have the scholarship on migration in the mix uh, to make this, this, this happen. Uh, so I don't know how many here are familiar with modern monetary theory. I am not a founder of that at all, of course. I'm just applying it. So I'm very grateful to all those uh, uh, who have developed modern monetary theory over, over the years. Um, and and grateful to sort of learn something very new uh, um, fr from from that uh, group of people. So I wrote this book. Uh, it's not showing. What happened? <laughs> okay, <laughs> it was blacked out. But I wrote this book that Stephanie mentioned, a, a, a modern migration theory, which was a take on showing that I was using uh, applying modern monetary theory to to uh, to migration. I uh, applied it broadly to the EU and then looked specifically at Sweden. It's a couple of years ago that I wrote the book, but and now I'm I'm looking into sort of what has happened since 2015, because we we have a lot of data to process from, from those years to see what, what really happened. And just to show you one example here, this just came out from Statistics Sweden, a report looking into how the unaccompanied minors that came in 2015, how they have fared, because that was the group that everybody agreed on would fare the worst. Uh, that was the biggest sort of both fiscal burden and societal burden in general for, for Sweden. And Sweden took a lot of unaccompanied minor, minors, and most of them stayed in Sweden. Now, um, we know the results, and the results are amazing, because this group is actually the one faring the best. Eight out of 10 un unaccompanied minors who came in 2015 are employed. Not only that, uh, they are employed to a higher degree than persons born in Sweden of the same age, and they make more than, than their, their peers who are, who are born in Sweden. So that's, that's just one illustration of sort of a success story, but that no one, I should say, in the, in the political field at the national level uh, wants to take credit for, because they have all decided that migration integration is a failure and so they don't want to they don't want to deal with with successes like this but the success doesn't stop there of course because now we also see a 
huge surge in the employment rate for the foreign born in Sweden. So the results again, not only of 2015, but much of it is akin to that. And of course, filling a, a, a tremendous labor shortage that Sweden, like so many other EU countries, uh, uh, suffers from. So we now have a, an employment rate for the foreign born of 70 over 75%. So that beats the overall average employment rate in the EU for the 20 to 64. Uh, again, showing something that no one in Sweden wants to take credit for. It, that, that it just passes the news and no one talks about it. Instead, they continue to talk about how integration is failing and that Sweden should never have done uh, what it did, has, has done over the past 20, 30 years, namely admit a lot of refugees. This picture then remains intact, particularly refugees are seen as fiscal burdens in the sense that they pay in less taxes than they get out of, of, of welfare. And so this division is then sort of both guiding the, the research debate and most of all the, the public policy uh, debate. That's why it's a bad idea for Sweden to have uh, 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 refugees. And if, of course, it's an inter interchange here between research and 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 policy and and media reporting and so on. That this is just this is just sort of an economic uh, truth. If you let in the low skilled and refugees, uh, the fiscal uh, uh, finances will deteriorate significantly. And I cover that very uh, in detail in my in my book. And no disagreement on the cost of refugee immigration. That's also a very sort of uh, uh, ingrained uh, notion in, in the Swedish debate. And so that's why last week there was a big debate in Sweden because the governing parties, they decided to launch this huge calculation of refugee uh, costs or migration costs in general. And they were gonna let one of the financial agencies do that study. So th that was the big, big uh, 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 sort of talk uh, uh, d debate last week in, 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 in Sweden. And they're of course they're doing it because they want to show that migration is, is a big cost. And what they're doing is that they're going to just count what the government spend, but never uh, account for where the money goes, which is of course the most crucial thing. I mean, spending always equals income. Aggregate spending is always from the government is always aggregate income. So where does the income go? But that is not part of, of this of this picture. Neither do they then, as I as I pointed to in the beginning, do they draw the crucial distinction between financial resources and real resources. And that is, of course, a starting point for modern uh, monetary theory. We always have constraints. In the, when it comes to real resources, namely labor, knowledge, natural resources, and so on. We always have constraints there. Yet, we always think of, 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 of in the opposite way. So we always start thinking that it's the money that we, that we lack. And so that financial resources, they are constrained. And then we don't, we don't think uh, 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 about it more, more than that, which is really, really backward because I mean, we know that from, from personal experience all the time. Like I've been working at the university for many, many years. Every year the government will make these, these uh, extra uh, 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 money uh, uh, available for universities because we have all these real resource uh, deficits. So more nurses, more, more social workers and so on. And they, the government, they, they credit our accounts and we get more money to educate more people. But then when the fall semester arrives, we don't see the amount of students for which we have money for. So we see that money was there, but the real resources didn't show up. And so again, we, we, we see that, that it, we need to look at it from, 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 from this real resource uh, perspective. And of course in Sweden, like many other countries, but I think Sweden sort of stands out here, uh, the real resource contribution from migration is incredible. This is just some some a little bit uh, of illustration of of that. Elderly care, uh, as you see, fifty five percent in the Stockholm region, 
uh, of those working in Swedish elderly care are foreign born. Uh, and I think this is increasing uh, 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 as we speak. And so, so the problem, and as I, as I argue in the book and, 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 and describe at great detail in, in the book, is that this whole debate is, although hardly ever made explicit, is based on the orthodox economics uh, 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 perspective. And a lot of it is then boils down to the sound finance approach to fiscal uh, uh, policy, right. namely the assumption that the central government uh, are basically analogous to households, so, so including all governments. MMT, of course, they singles out governments that that uh, uh, issue their own sovereign currencies and have a, a floating exchange rate. So fiat currency countries. I will show why this more and more applies to the eurozone too, but that's a sort of household uh, uh, framework, and so that governments are always revenue constrained. They need to borrow from financial markets. They need tax revenue before they can spend, and so they they are so constrained. Again, money wise, they are they are super constrained, and that's why we need allegedly all these financial fiscal frameworks to keep uh, uh, governments uh, within the bounds. Uh, uh, and, and, and that is, of course, devastating because what we confuse here is that we, 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 uh, we don't, we take, uh, we think of politically and ideologically based fiscal frameworks as, as basically coming from economic laws of gravity but what we see during crisis when these uh, fiscal frameworks are suspended is that that is not the, the the case at all these are politically based they have no bearing on 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 e e economic sort of rules or, or laws but what we get out of this is of course that more spending on refugees means by definition less spending on something else like the elderly so that's why migration is i mean mmt is very much applied to climate policy and so on to uh, unemployment policy and so on i take it to be very important in this debate on migration because here we have people coming into societies so it's not a, a fight between more money for schools or more money for elderly care here's here is the the, the fight between more money for elderly care, care or more money for for foreigners coming in and that's why it make make the, why this debate is particularly uh, uh, toxic so just doing a little bit description of, of of mmt then turns all of this on on its head and simply describes how governments spend meaning governments that have their own currencies floating exchange rates and 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 so on they spend from thin air by crediting bank accounts. More detail, they credit central banks with, with reserves and the deposit uh, accounts of, or recipients with, with deposits. This is just a description, it has nothing to do with, with, with politics or policy. And that's why, so, so Dirk Enns, who is one of the, the best European MMTers, he emphasizes that all of this is falsifiable all of this can be tested. It's not like neoclassical sort of assumptions. This is hardcore falsifiable stuff. You can really check uh, uh, this if you like, like Dirk Gens has, has done. So he checked how does the German government start its spending in the morning? Does it, have, does it have any money? No, it doesn't have any money. Money is created out of thin air. I checked for Sweden, the same there. The government's account with the central bank is at zero in the morning, and then it starts spending. In the evening, if there's a deficit, the rules kick in, but then they are shown as rules, politically based, ideologically founded, not having anything to do with the government's ability to spend its own currency. And again, Eurozone is a little bit different, but after PEP, it is quite similar. And again, the taxation is just the reverse. So the government first has to spend before it can tax. 
So when taxes are paid, the central bank debits bank reserves. And for there to be any reserves to debit, the central government first has to create these reserves. Again, it's just description, it has nothing to do with, with, with politics. And there are only three sources of bank reserves. They're all created by the combined uh, unit of the central bank and the treasury. So it's from government spending, central bank purchases, and central bank lending. And then we come to borrowing. Well, the government sells bonds in exchange for reserves, but reserves can only be created by the central government. Again, treasury plus the central bank. So hence, in order for the banks to buy bonds from the central government, the central government must first provide these reserves. Again, from this, we see that this is not borrowing in the sense that we as households borrow money or as businesses borrow money or as municipalities borrow money. Again, the central government spends and lends first. Then, by definition, that's the only time it can tax and, and sell bonds. And that, of course, does for our standing of, of deficits and debt, it, it, it deficits is simply when the government taxes uh, 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 less than it spends, and that accumulates as, as a debt. What is then, how can MMT explain in a more fruitful way what the national debt is? Well, it's simply all the money that the government has spent over time that it hasn't taxed back yet. So the debt is our money. That's our savings. That's the financial savings in the private sector. And how that can be something bad is, is, is a puzzle when you understand it like, like this. Because we think of the debt as our burden, when in fact it's our savings. And that's, that's really sort of a, a groundbreaking way of conceiving and understanding a debt. So instead of them thinking of the state when it spends on refugee integration and, 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 and reception and integration as first having to take money from the private sector, from us in forms of taxes or from a, 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 a borrowing from the, from the private sector, it starts by spending out of thin air credits the accounts out in the economy. And this picture here is, of course, showing really what focusing on what, what happened in Sweden after 2015. The government credited the accounts, mostly of the municipalities who are responsible for reception and integration. They received a lot of money for the first time in ages because of the extremely austere fiscal framework of the Swedish in, in, in Sweden. That meant that they could, for the first time in a long time, also start spending on, on welfare. So this common notion that there is a trade-off between spending on low-income migrants or refugees and spending on welfare is sort of, this is what I mean with the, with the Swedish model there was no trade-off. On the contrary, and especially municipalities, poor municipalities, small municipalities, depopulating municipalities who happen to take in a disproportionate amount of, of refugees, they were very happy. They saw this as an opportunity, not as a, as a, as a burden. Uh, and it meant that they could now spend. And if you look at how, when it's plotted out, you see that the smaller the municipality, the more money per capita in that municipality. So in really small municipalities, there was a net income for each inhabitant of, of, of cra crazy amount of, of money. Of course, the, the, the state in Sweden uh, had a public consumption during this year that it hadn't had since the 1970s. And that, of course, drove growth a lot because there was so much to do for the private sector uh, providing uh, uh, goods and, and, and services. And of course, a lot of people were employed and because un employment rose uh, due to the, the effort of, of taking in uh, plus 160,000 refugees in a very short time. So this is really how, how to look at it. It's simply crediting the accounts that is the net income from the government spend, from spending for the, the non-government uh, sector. 
And again, by definition, spending equals income. There is nothing dangerous with the government providing us with income. Uh, quite the contrary, it helps stabilize the, 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 the economy. It, and it helps us from going to the bank to finance uh, everything because we can finance more from, from uh, uh, income. And that's what I mean when the government now is saying that it, it should uh, account for how much uh, migration costs ask instead of where the income goes and, and, and then draw the conclusions. So in 2016, again, cash-strapped municipalities in Sweden had their best year in history. Uh, almost, almost all of them ran surpluses. And again, surpluses in municipalities who are income dependent and revenue constrained is a good thing. Surpluses at the central government is simply our loss. And it's not a particularly good good thing. Um, so this is again the the reason Sweden could do what it what it did was because it suspended its as I said austere fiscal rules. The, the Swe yeah. Swedish rules are not minus three percent; they are at this time was plus one percent. So the government, central government, was supposed to run a a a continuous. Uh, budget surplus over the the, the cycle, um, but it suspended that so that the government could focus on uh, something real rather than this imagined thing of of uh, uh, the fiscal uh, uh, surplus. Uh, and again, the, the, the why it's an EMMT moment is because it showed that the that the emperor was was naked. Things worked very well during these years, even though the debate at the time was saying that Sweden would crash. And some even said that there would be super much inflation in Sweden because there were, the, on the one hand, the economy would overheat and the, on the other hand, it would crash. And, and these were all sort of the judgments of the best and the brightest people within the, the, the fiscal uh, uh, agencies who were supposed to then, to, who, who's tasked with uh, sort of directing and advising the, the, the government's fiscal policy. And the government, of course, was never talking about this this moment as something necessary good. It was always a necessary evil, in contrast to pandemic spending, which was a necessary good. Uh, but it worked uh, very, very well. And I argue that this, of course, invented the wheel for how the EU in, at, at large could rethink the fiscal approach to refugee reception. It didn't, but the pandemic did. And so we had the same sort of procedure in, in uh, during the pandemic. Uh, in and what is interesting there is, of course, the eurozone. To look at MMT in relation to the eurozone, because the the of course the fiscal austerity rules were finally suspended, uh, and the implementation of the ECB's pandemic emergency purchase program, the PEP, of course, cleared everything. So. Did any country run out of money? Greece had much, much higher debt at this time, but did not run out of money as it was doing in uh, in 2010 and then and then later on in, in 14, 15 or, or so. So there was not any problems. Now the PEP is no more, but the ECB, they have installed the Transmission Protection Instrument, TPI, which is just telling bond markets that, look, if there, if there is a spike in interest rates, we can and we will buy all the bonds necessary to push down uh, uh, lending rates. So that that is sort of the, the legacy. No one talks about this or very few talks about this. Everybody wants to talk about the rescue money, which didn't do anything during the pandemic in itself. They're helping afterwards. But explaining why countries didn't run out of money that is the, the the where the focus should be because if we focus on that we will understand modern monetary theory because that's what they said uh, and that's why they predicted uh, what would happen the different scenarios that would happen uh, as the as the eurozone went along and I, I just found this quote in one, an earlier powerpoint and i realized man that was a long time it feels like a long time ago 
remember when the commission and, and and Rome they were debating every week there was like could the Italian government have a 2.1 or no maybe 1.9 deficit all these sort of useless exercises that we haven't heard uh, uh, about in a long time they may come back next year because there is this debate about reinstalling austerity rules which yeah it's it's beyond belief that we have that we even have that debate but that's that's where where europe uh, is uh, so the pandemic then was another amazing learning experience or an opportunity uh, uh, to learn and it should have taught us just as a swedish refugee crisis that governments can spend whatever they think is necessary to solve problems and that is that is key for for the survival of of society that is done by keystroke on central bank computers no problem but as i said what a pandemic also should have taught us is that nurses cleaners uh, agricultural workers uh, doctors what have you they are not created through keystrokes on a computer they are that, that's real resource that's where we have constraints and uh, that's also the art of politics and policy to make sure that those real resources are mobilized in society that we have enough nurses that we have enough uh, uh, teachers and 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 so on refugees and labor migrants they help to ease those constraints Yet my argument here is not to say that Europe or the EU should admit refugees because the EU benefits from it. I'm saying that we don't have a choice there. That's just, that's just we, there is really no argument. The EU cannot but benefit uh, for, from, from, from doing this. And so my final slide is, again, I could have started this and then we could have started talking because that's really the only information we need. During COVID, there, of course, is work coming out, what happened. The overarching picture is that of a migrant workforce that acts as an integral part in keeping basic and necessary functions of European societies working amidst periods of forced closure. It is worth stressing how among migrants, the low skilled workers are especially overrepresented in a number of key occupations that are vital in the fight against COVID-19. So this is Fasani and Massa in a, a, a very interesting paper on who, who did the heavy lifting disproportionately during during uh, uh, COVID. So just having this in front of us, why are we talking about the costs of migration? Uh, th that That is a, something we, we should be able to sort of part ways with and, and instead look at the more uh, 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 important matters. That's 24 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Impressive timekeeping um, and very interesting. So we'll open up the floor now uh, to questions. We'll start here in the room and then go um, online. If you have a question and you are joining us online, if you could write it in the chat, that would be most appreciated. So we'll take two questions and then turn it over uh, to Dr. Hansen so he can respond to them. Um, and then we'll kind of keep going. So James, we'll start with you. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. It was really just I enjoyed it so much, and I think the, the idea is great, and it's really exciting. So I have three sort of points on it. The, well, the first point I want to make is actually I read your book, Your Africa, eight or nine years ago, and I really loved it. That's a great book. Everyone should, everyone should read it if they get a chance. The second small point, before I get into the actual nuts and bolts of your argument, is that why would you call it modern migration theory? Shouldn't it be modern migratory theory? Like, if you want to have the analogy with modern monetary theory, then that would be a, a better analogy. Um, okay, so on to the actual argument. I think I really agree with your argument. And uh, I also, it's very timely, actually, we were discussing this just yesterday, that as radical right parties enter government, they're demanding that the central government release these figures. They've done it just in, in the Netherlands a few days ago. And in Denmark, I think it was a year, a couple of years ago, maybe. They demand that they release the figures by national origin. Um, and they indeed show that the net, the net fiscal contribution is extremely high from Western countries and extremely low, to, uh, broadly speaking here, from, uh, from non-Western countries. And that's obviously used uh, just exactly as you showed for political 
reasons. So that makes it really timely. You give, you're on the way to making a great repost. What I didn't like so much about the presentation was that you present it, even though you're right, I think, I, you, by presenting it in slightly polemic form, you make it less convincing to a neutral or certainly an opponent. And I'll give a few reasons why I think that's the case. So I think it would be better to give neoclassical economics a fair crack of the whip from the start and also, uh, and then do same with your analogy of whatever we want to call this, this neoclassical migration theory. Otherwise synthesis would be impossible. And what I felt like you did and what people often do for obvious reasons with neoclassical economics is they say, oh, there is no government credit card. There is, it's not like a household, blah, blah, blah. These analogies are wrong and that's right. But neoclassical econo econ um, economists don't say that. That's what right-wing politicians say. So it's a bit unfair to use like academic arguments to undermine the credit card analogy because neoclassical economics is not just wrong it's built on assumptions you can some of those assumptions are bad i don't think that they say that we're going to run out of money i think that they say that if you don't uh control spending then you it will lead to things like inflation declining living standards overall and and of the bottom line, the great insight of neoclassical economics against the Keynesian approach, which is basically what you're suggesting, is that reality exists. You said at some point that the government can spend whatever it wants to solve problems. And even though I would say that what's happened since 2008 between the US getting richer and stronger and the EU and UK getting poorer and weaker validates that Keynesian argument, that doesn't mean that you can go to the extent that you can spend everything. Eventually, there are consequences of, of expenditure. It, it is real, reality does exist. So despite that, I agree with you. So I would, I would uh, frame it much more in attacking, or maybe not attacking, but dissecting the arguments of neoclassical economics on a bit more of a theoretical ground. And, uh, the way I would do it and the way I would reframe your argument is via the main Keynesian insight, which is that rather than worrying about balance sheets, you should worry correctly, and this is this is right, about the counterfactual. Your argument is essentially that the counterfactual, where we don't have these migrants coming, would be worse despite these micro level trends. The, the, the counterfactual, these migrants here would be, everyone would be worse off because there would, this fiscal stimulus would disappear. And I think that's correct. But to show that, you, you need to actually show that. What you do here is offer some analogies to start with, which I don't think are that fair, like eight out of 10 working age people are employed that are migrants. Okay, but the argument that you're attacking is lifetime net contribution. So to look at the working age employment rate, I don't think it's totally fair. And I would reframe the whole thing as a counterfactual. So like modern migratory theory could be like the counterfactual where we have low migration is that we're literally all worse off. And that goes against the, the beauty of that is that it's attacking neoclassical economics head on, which is saying not that we'll run out of money, but that we'll be worse off if we don't restrain spending or restrain immigration rates. Uh, James, I'm going to interject okay, so we can get to another one. Thank sorry. you. Um, so I know you're still jotting down notes. I'll go here for another question and then give you a chance to respond. Thank you so much. Hi, hello. Thank you so much. It was uh, really a pleasure to, to, to learn from you. I'm an economist and uh, I share most of your arguments and uh, I think I agree with James uh, this is a very relevant topic and it was uh, I mean you presented the case of Sweden but uh, it is very similar also in Italy and um, my question is related to basically the target of your book I are, are you speaking to policymakers or the civil society and the, the, the general public because to me um, all of this uh, discussion, which is relevant and which is uh, real, 
also at some point boiled down um, into the issue that basically people were kind of against migrants, even though they 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 cost nothing. So basically, um, at some point, I mean, the cost benefit analysis is not uh, um, salient or is not uh, is not driving. Um, people's attitudes and people's choice they make and also people's actions in terms of uh, xenophobia and discrimination. So to what extent do you think uh, um, we should basically target uh, in terms of policy implication, policymakers versus uh, the, the civil society? And how would you do that? Is it a matter of changing um, policy choices in terms of, for example, giving more incentives to people to to be welcoming, to give kind of prizes, awards, you know, in, in, in economics, there is cost, but also incentives, or is it a matter of communication? So we have two policy tools and also two targets. I'm, I'm, I just wonder what's the, um, the, I mean, how, how you, 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 you think we should proceed in terms of policy or you, what, uh, what you do you report in your book? Thank you. Just to, to so, you wonder who I am addressing, uh, sort of policymakers, civil society. I can answer that directly. I'm I'm addressing both, because my writing is also for for. Uh, I mean, I write a lot in newspapers in in Sweden and and so on, and try to be accessible to to civil society. I I give a lot of talks to everything from the Swedish church to the Red Cross to uh, all kinds of civil society organizations on the one hand. But on the other hand, I also direct my work a lot to policymakers. So I speak to policymakers uh, very often, um, a, a lot at local levels, but but also at, at, at central levels. I will try to convince three Sweden Swedish parliamentarians on Monday uh, of the relevance of MMT because I'm going to debate with them. So I, I I try to to sort of position my argument and frame it for 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 different audiences that because I think that's that's very important when we come to this issue because it's both very the the, the cost of migration thing is is so ingrained everywhere in society. Um, so. It, I hope that 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 answered uh, to, to your uh, uh, question. I mean, if you read my book, you will see that I go through neoclassical uh, uh, the fiscal impact of migration literature in quite some detail. They do say that there is a strict solvency requirements on governments on how much they can spend without risking solvency. They do say in plain language that the government spends like a household. <coughs> I'm not making this up. This is what they what they claim, and of course, the, that's the economics, the, the purely economics literature on the fiscal impact of migration. It is a huge literature. All they say is the sort of question begging because they start the whole thing by saying, if you admit uh, uh, low earning migrants, they will be a fiscal burden. If you admit high earning migrants, they will be a, a fiscal asset. <laughs> that's what they claim that that's the sort of assumption and then they they make the accounting meaning they just count on how much the government spend and then they can say that this is this is how it is so they can confirm what they what they already uh, assumed so so yes i mean here i'm a bit polemical and i i decided because i was thinking maybe i should just go over the neoclassical claims uh in in this in this uh uh, uh but I felt I, I I wanted to be more sort of broad, and then I'm sorry. Yeah, I I do cut corners, <laughs> de de definitely. Um, but uh, in in but again, in terms of of what neoclassical e e economics say here, um, I I would not uh, uh, agree. They they do they are quite explicitly saying saying these things that 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 I'm that I mentioned um many of them don't take sides of course they don't say it's good or bad it's just that they 
that they that they say that uh, you 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 have to be careful and what they what they of course never i mean there's so many wrongs with neoclassical e e economics of, of course and i i can't go 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 through them them all but i mean this whole focus on on the central government and its fiscal uh, uh, policy, I think, is 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 totally m misplaced. And and again, that's when Godley's uh, sectoral balance approach has to be applied. Otherwise, you will not understand. So I brought this slide just to show you from 1990 to 1993. If you look at Sweden, uh, these are the years we are told that the government spent too much, and that's why we were driven into chaos and, and a total uh, a crisis. But as you see here, and this is again, sectoral balances applying Wynne Godley's uh, method, you see that, in fact, the problem in Sweden before it crashed what that, was that we had too high government surpluses and a too too. Uh, indebted private sector, the red line here. Uh, those things are never acknowledged in, in neoclassical economics. And that's because they model the government as a household. And that is, again, that, that is very uh, explicit uh, in the literature. And the interesting thing is that during this, the, the Swedish uh, so-called refugee crisis, what all economists agreed from from the, the the government's budget office to all these as I as I go through all these fiscal authorities in Sweden, they all did this a, a type of uh, accounting. They simply said the government is spending a lot, too much, and that will drive deficits. That will be a, 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 a devastating, as they said, for 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 the Swedish economy. But they of course didn't understand anything of this. And that is neo neoclassical e economics in in uh, and and also in practice because that that's what we continue to do and that's why we still have these the, these these debates. So uh, I I take more more questions. Sorry. Yeah, that. we have a number of questions. So we'll go to Claire and then Tor and then uh, to Andrew and Martin. Thanks so much for the talk. Um, I'm afraid I haven't had the chance like others to read your book, but um, hopefully I'll get the chance in the future. Um, as I listened, um, I suppose the first question that came to me was the extent to which your theory is or isn't dependent on different types of welfare state models and by association, different types of politics across countries, because you're talking about potential application at the EU level. Your focus has been on Sweden. And I'm wondering, you know, the extent to which the Swedish welfare state being a universal welfare state has greater capacity than other types of welfare states to absorb. Um, you know, more cost um, to spend more and the type of structural funding arrangement. I'm thinking in my head, um, the kind of extension of the sort of Corpi Palme argument about the paradox of redistribution and whether your theory links into that type of thinking. Um, so just would welcome your comments. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the stimulating presentation. I also apologize for not having read the book, although it was highly recommended to me by a friend of us. Um, um, yeah, I, I enjoyed the talk, but I, at some point I, I thought, well, what you're saying is perfectly fungible across sectors. I mean, what you say is a passionate defense of modern monetary policy theory. Um, but what is specific about migration? If you had spoken about education or health or any other welfare policy, and actually it echoes a lot, and, and this resonates with Claire's argument maybe, with defenses of welfare spending, uh, there is a huge liter literature around uh, about the, the fact that welfare spending is an investment and not, and not, and not a pure cost. And 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 also the word investment never came up in your in your presentation. And it's in the economic literature, maybe something of a political bridge between neoclassical economics and, and modern monetary theory, uh, with the claim that you at some point made at the beginning that in the long run uh expenditures on uh uh, refugee integration pays off. 
but you didn't walk down that line and 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 I wanted to have your feedback on on the idea which is also communication wise maybe more productive that uh, modern monetary theory uh, at the end of the day speaks about uh, uh, debit as an investment Andrew and then Martin. Thanks, Pio. So uh, I think we, we benefit from the YouTube talk you gave during the pandemic, and I've read the book, and I'm still still kind of uh, trying to grasp all the implications of it, and it's uh, a really fascinating uh, agenda. I wanted just to think, as I, I was thinking about it, I also began to think about another Swedish social theorist, Niels Brunson, and his work on the hip organizational hypocrisy. And, and it maybe goes to what Maria Pia was saying also, because I think in your talk, we get a lot of economics of policy. And I was thinking about a little bit about the politics of policy and your understanding of the organization of interest around policy, because it seems to me that what you're saying is that Politicians in Sweden and many of the countries are saying one thing and doing other things in terms of the emissions policies they pursue, not just on refugee settlement, but on other areas of settlement as well. And it, it, it strikes me that what you're also demonstrating here is in terms of modern uh, migration theory is also this kind of underlying hypocrisy, which for Brunton is kind of functional to modern organisations because of this kind of what he would see as the competing and at times contradictory interests. And I wondered how you maybe slightly unfair to kind of put you in, in, in rest of that debate, but this kind of underlying conceptualization of the organization of interests uh, and how that affects the arguments that you're developing. And, and perhaps also because also a lot of your arguments are on the power of perception and misperception as well. So I maybe it wasn't phrased very coherently, but I hope you see what I'm trying to get. Okay, thank you, yeah. Yeah, thanks. No, I enjoyed the talk and I had the opportunity to read the book uh, a couple of years ago and, and discuss um, with you. Uh, today, I, I just want to ask if you can say a little bit about the experiences you've had kind of taking this to the policy world. Uh, and it also sort of links to James's point in terms of it's the way you do it and the kind of framing you've chosen. Because I'm asking because I mean you basically you're building your argument based on 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 the theory that 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 you believe in that is discussed some people disagree you say you say this is right everybody else is the other people are wrong and certain things follow from this and um so i mean we've seen what can happen when when you know people take i don't know if you think about what happened in the uk kind of with list trust kind of the idea of the kind of unfunded tax cuts and so right or wrong the markets react and and very bad consequences follow so the idea of basically saying that there's this new theory that proves the other theory is wrong and then there's some radical policy implications and this is what we should do um is there a concern that this might generate some you know responses which are maybe kind of going in the, the, the direction that is different from where you want to go so there's two questions on the on the kind of why why i mean i can understand the maybe polemical is the right word or not you come across very strongly you're saying this is this is right you believe in it but you kind of really reject everything else completely uh, so there's kind of why you chose this framing and then what are the implications when you take this actually to, to the policy world? All right. We've given you quite the quite the task or lineup of questions, but you can take the next uh, good five to six minutes and just close out our time. Okay. <laughs> so welfare models, that, that's that's a very good question because I would say that the Swedish model, welfare model, is actually very, very ill adapted to what happened, because Sweden, due to its uh, to its uh, austere fiscal framework that was adopted in the 90s, Sweden has devolved financial responsibility to the regional and to the local level a lot. So we don't have we don't have anything like a national school uh, or a national health care. Or it's, it's all sort of. And because that makes the books look better up uh, centrally, and then they can just uh, like the by law saying that municipalities they have to run balanced budgets. That's just how it is. That's part of the framework. So I would say that the Swedish system was very ill ill adapted in a financial 
way to do this. But that was where the central government came in. And that's why we showed it even more forcefully. Look, this is what we can do. We don't have to have these, uh, this austerity permanently in all the, the welfare services. We don't have to do that. And that was why it's sort of a real sort of a laboratory that you can all also, you can really see what happens. So I think that that, that was very powerful uh, 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 to me. And of course, municipalities will then say, well, we could have gone on doing this, then we could have been able to do what we need to do in elderly care or in schools and 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 and, and so on. But then the state goes in and it closes uh, it, it, it's spending and it's back to austerity again. And that is, of course, creating a lot of volatility in the system. One year you have just so much money and the next year it's back to, to austerity. So that, that, that's, that's, that's not a go good. And I think that that ties in with, with your question about uh, the reception from, from policymakers. I mean, I speak to a lot uh, of municipal policymakers and they say precisely this, that we want more sort of, we want to be able to look at these things long-term. Um, and interestingly, I have a, a new PhD student who before she began, she wrote this really interesting report uh, where she went to two municipalities in Sweden and looked and detailed how they how they work today with integration and labor market for for uh, uh, for refugees. And she was saying that despite the fact that the central government are now constraining municipalities much more, because the central government basically is is sort of destroying integration. It it doesn't want anything of it. Uh, yet these uh, municipalities, no matter political color, they persist in working and innovating like crazy, sort of very creatively doing. And that's why we have this success. That's why why why, I, why we can show that there is such a growth. Uh, in, in employment and, and so on. And for the unaccompanied minor, those results are very much dependent on what happens at the local level. Yet no one wants to talk about the local level. It's all the simulated politics at the national level. That's all we hear about, which is really sad because the effects in Sweden are quite startling. I, I looked at one municipality in, in particular, which has been run by, by, by Christian Democrats majority and it's been a most progressive sort of uh, uh, refugee uh, municipality where even the extreme right-wing representative is saying that yes we we agree with receiving a lot of refugees here because it works and that's not the only place where that has happened um so i think that that's really really interesting to to hear and they understand what I'm talking about. They understand practically modern monetary theory because they are so, especially small municipalities, politicians there, they have to know budget in a real, real, real way. And they, they, just, uh, they just get it, uh, sort of. Um, so, but then um, uh, about investment, yeah, you're absolutely right, and I talk about that a lot in the book, and of course relating it to what what fiscal rules, what they do to public investment, and that is of course a, a huge EU problem that we've had such low uh, uh, public investment uh, from from the 90s uh, uh, on onward. However, I'm not saying, just to, to jump to what another comment you made, I'm not saying long run, not long term stuff. Uh, uh, migration is not good for the long term. It's not good for short. That is not relevant to me uh, from, from a fiscal perspective. Uh, when, as I said, aggregate spending is aggregate income, and that is good always. So where we have constraints, those are the real ones. And that goes for, for everything. So if you do admit a lot of refugees and you don't have enough real resources to cope, that is the constraint. It's not a financial constraint. And, and the government spend, spending 
is is good in the short term it's good in the midterm it's good in the long term it's always good because it helps the private sector not to go crazy with with credit uh, financed spending and it stabilizes the, the the economy at the municipal level as i said that's exactly what they what they what they demand we want stability but you're not getting you're not giving it to us and so right now after the pandemic sweden is in a new uh, cuts spree in healthcare, exactly what they promised us they would never again cut in. But now the regions are cutting, like firing nurses, although they need more nurses. So th 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 that's how, how um, yeah, how bad it, it gets. To your, it, it, I'm really speeding it up here. Uh, Andrew, to your question, Again, that goes to, if I understood you correctly, that goes to sort of looking at the central and local level. Because uh, what, I mean, the, the, the central government will, will, as I said, when in 2015, the social democratic government, they suspended the fiscal framework to, to allow for spending on, on, on the refugees, uh, they constantly, said that this is a bad thing and as i said during the pandemic they constantly said this is a good thing that we're suspending the fiscal framework and spending so that was a qualitatively qualitatively huge difference in how they put it however at the local level uh, there was again a, a, a cross party uh, colors uh, there was a lot of of um, goodwill around the spending uh, and I think that that the sort of intention um, is is yeah it it's very much re revolving around that that uh, uh, dynamic. And as I said right now, no one, uh, not even I mean certainly not the social democrats in Sweden, want to take credit for the fact that the 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 things I show around employment and 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 so on. Um, and I think that's that's. The national level politics there is 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 really, yeah, it's it's very much triangulation simulation, uh, not wanting to deal with real issues, um, and yeah, I, I hope. Um, I mean, b back to MMT, um, Martin, about me saying that everybody else is is wrong. Um, MMT is a theory, but it's most of all in the beginning, just a description. And as I said, that description can be falsified. So far, no one has been able to do that in that sense of saying that, how does the government spend those basic things? Reserves, no one can say that reserves can be created by us or the private sector in general cannot happen bank reserves is the monopoly uh, issuance of the central government meaning treasury and the central bank if we get that down because you cannot argue against that and if you will ask central bankers they will admit if we can get that down we have won so much for the larger description because then we get away from all the neoclassical notions of the government being in the hands of the private sector, that it needs to borrow from the financial markets. We can set up rules that make it appear as if that is the economic necess necessity, sure. And if you borrow in a foreign currency, yes, then the constraints apply just as when we borrow in a bank. If, you, if a government borrows a foreign currency that it does not issue itself, then... So I'm more talking at, at that level. And again, Liz Truss, that was a perfect MNT moment again. Who cleared it? Well, the Bank of England. <laughs> they just stepped in and said, let's get rid of this crazy thing. And then things went back to normal. Markets calmed and everything. And that's also empirically, just look at Japan. Japan controls and has done so for decades, both short-term and long-term interest rates. Those rates are, the, 
the, the central bank rate is a policy rate, not a market rate. Again, that can be proven very, in, in very great detail. And that's what quantitative easing was, keeping long-term rates low. And that can be, be done for as long as the central bank wants that to be the case. So I'm more talking about those, those, those things. Politically, I think you're absolutely right. Politically, MMT can be used by anyone. It's not left or right in that simple way. And, and that's also important to, to keep in mind that there is that descriptive level uh, uh, that, 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 that we first need to understand. From that descriptive understanding, we can then draw the policy implications. And of course, the most important one is just to say very moderately, that we have much more capacity, fiscal capacity, than we think we do. So that 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 would just be the the sort of yeah easy, easy uh, uh, conclusion. I probably haven't. Uh, I stopped there. Yeah, we <laughs> have to uh, out of time. unfortunately wrap up. But that's always the sign of a um, good presentation that there. Are, there's more to say um, and more we want to say. So thank you so much for joining us and for a really thought-provoking conversation. Thank you everyone in the room for joining us for our last um, Migration Policies Seminar Series of 2023. Um, there is one final Migration Working Group Seminar that is happening this Thursday at 1030. Um, if you want to make sure to hear about um, all of our future upcoming events and trainings, make sure you sign up for your newsletter, which you can do by clicking the QR code in front of you or on the screen. Um, thank you so much for coming, everyone and have a good rest of your day.